Hey there, and welcome to the Hour of History podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Bauman, and this week I'm talking to Dr. David Bryden, who's just written Franco's Internationalists, Social Experts and Spain's Search for Legitimacy. It's a fantastic conversation we have that covers how Franco's sort of international organizations go beyond World War II through the war after the Spanish Civil War and survive survive through this world realignment that a lot of people often periodize as a new world beginning in 1945. Uh, David kind of shows how some of these links continue throughout. It's a fascinating conversation, and we have good news for you. If you head over to hourofhistory.com, you can get the full book for free because it is being published open access through Oxford University Press. So be sure to head over to hourofhistory.com to read the book after you hear this great conversation. Thanks so much for listening on Hour of History. It's our world, anytime, any place. Enjoy. You're listening to the Hour of History podcast. Our world, anytime, any place. For show notes, links, and more, be sure to visit our website at www.hourofhistory.com. And for all the book recommendations made during the podcast, head over to hourofhistory.com forward slash rex. That's hourofhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. Without further delay, your Hour of History starts right now. Hey, David. So I'm so happy to have you with us on Hour of History. Your new book, Franco's Internationalists, Social Experts and Spain's Search for Legitimacy is, is a fascinating. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, so I'm a, a lecturer in the history of modern international relations at King's College London. Um, I, uh, before I was at King's, I was at Birkbeck, which is part of the University of London, but is a, is a kind of a night school, like um, uh, most of our students there are uh, mature students. Um, and I came through Birkbeck, so I um, originally didn't study history at all, and I uh, wasn't an academic, so I spent uh, many years doing various kind of jobs, ended up doing a relatively boring uh, kind of middle management job. And then while I was doing that, I, uh, I went back to do a master's in uh, modern history at Birkbeck. And ended up uh, enjoying it so much that I stayed. And so I did my uh, my PhD at Birkbeck, where I kind of uh, did a lot of this research, and I taught there for a couple of years. Um, and now I've moved down to King's. So I work mainly on uh, the history of internationalism and international cooperation, but also, obviously, for, as you can tell from the book, on the history of modern Spain as well. Wow. So internationalism seems like it's a hot topic now. As as uh, you know, we go into f- further fragments of, of, of the world. Um, is your background, is, were the other sort of jobs that you just described, did they have anything to do with internationalism? Uh, no, absolutely nothing to do with internationalism at all. So my kind of interest in that came partly from my, my kind of uh, my master's study, but mainly um, from the, when I was doing my um, PhD, I was part of a project on the history of internationalism and in Europe in the 20th century, which was a kind of a collaborative project. It was funded by the Wellcome Trust, which is a, a kind of a research body based in the UK, which mainly funds medical research, but also the medical humanities. And our project had a particular focus on um, public health and internationalism. So the way that um, international cooperation has revolved around um, uh, uh, kind of global health, um, um, you know, um, uh, responses to the kind of the health uh, uh, crises caused by war, caused by migration, by refugee movements, and, and things like that. Hmm, it's interesting. And so, uh, this project, then this new book, came out of what was a dissertation. Yes, it was. Yes, this was basically my uh, my PhD dissertation. So, as I said, we were, I was working on this uh, this project, and there were I think four or five of us working on various different case studies on internationalism in Europe in the twentieth century. So we had people working on uh, Yugoslavia and Hungary and uh, Soviet Union, uh, and my work was on my project was on on Spain. So the book came out of that uh, that uh, PhD project. Interesting, and and Spain seems to be a country that gets overlooked quite a lot. Um, especially, you know, there's a ton of focus on World War II. My own work is is around that time period, and but Spain is so important. Um, could you give us a little background? Why why is Spain matter? <laughs> yeah, so that's a really good question. I mean, um, and I think one of the things that we wanted to do with this project that I was working on, uh, which is called the Reluctant Internationalist, was to think um, uh, to kind of decenter the history, the kind of the geography of internationalism a little bit, and and move away from the kind of the 
the countries like Britain, France and the US, which normally feature at the, uh, the centre of histories of internationalism and international relations, and think more about uh, countries in Europe, which, uh, which tend to be overlooked. So, you know, Spain is a very good example, as you said, but also places like uh, Hungary, uh, Yugoslavia, countries from uh, southern and eastern Europe who get left out of these kind of histories. Mm. I think Spain is important. I mean, for people who kind of work on either European or international history, that we kind of come across Spain when we think about maybe the, the Spanish Civil War. Mm. But for lots of people, it's not something that they really pay any attention to beyond, beyond the war. Um, for me, I think it's, I mean, I'm reluctant to say it's uh, important and people have overlooked it's important because, you know, how can we say that we are in one country is more important than, uh, than any other? But I think uh, it's certainly very interesting, and particularly the, the period I work on, which is the, the Franco uh, dictatorship, which lasted from the Spanish Civil War in the end of the 1930s until Franco died peacefully in his bed during 1975, I think is particularly interesting partly because of its longevity, right? So Franco is a, uh, a dictator who mer emerges from fascist era Europe, who comes to power with the aid of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy during the Spanish Civil War, uh, but doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't leave in 1945, doesn't, uh, doesn't collapse, who manages to uh, keep hold of uh, power um, until the mid-1970s, when the world is obviously very different from the, uh, what the world looked like in the 1930s. And I think that process in itself is very interesting, right? And uh, I think one of the things, uh, if, for those of us who work on 20th century history, one of one of the things it maybe uh, brings into relief is is how uh, much continuity there is between the the pre Second World War period and the post Second World War period. So we often think of 1945 as the point when you know everything changed, right? When fascism uh, collapsed, when the kind of the uh, the conflicts of the that characterized the first half of the 20th century ended, when the new Cold War began. Uh, when new kind of uh, in the West, new kind of liberal democratic ideas uh, were in the ascendancy. But if you look at the history of Spain, that's obviously not the case. And so I think it, uh, we, you know, we have to ask if you know, Franco managed to, uh, the Franco regime la managed to last for so long, what does that tell us about the wider history of, of Europe and, and, uh, and kind of international organizations in the middle of the 20th century? And it is uh, really fascinating. I know anytime I've taught undergrads, they're kind of surprised to see these images of Franco with Hitler and, and Himmler and, mm -hmm. and all these sort of things. And then he kind of survives. And then you see him in the 50s and 60s and the 70s. Yeah. And you're just kind of like, whoa, uh, what happened here? And I think your book does a good job of that and, and tying these threads, like you said, from pre-war to post-war, but but it takes some some interesting maneuvering. Now, your book isn't focused though on Franco; it's focused mm -hmm. on his internationalists, right? Mm -hmm. So, who are these internationalists? So, the, the people I focus on the book are I've called them social experts. So, they're the people who work in the fields of public health, of um, welfare and social security, uh, of uh, in some cases medicine and uh, medical research, uh, and. I think they're particularly interesting because um, those, the kind of the leading social experts in the early stage of the Franco regime were all to a greater or lesser degree supporters of the Franco regime. Now, kind of, I say that with, um, uh, yeah, with some kind of caveats, but broadly speaking, that obviously the Spanish Civil War divided Spanish society in two. Many of the leading uh, experts, Spanish experts in, uh, in those fields, supported the Republic, um, and many of them went into exile after the Second World War. So there are lots of um, uh, uh, very kind of eminent Spanish medical and health and welfare experts who ended up in, uh, in North America, in Latin America, in places like France after the, the Spanish Civil War. Uh, those who remain in Spain, if they've, uh, re, uh, if they've supported the Republic, many of them lose their jobs, lose their positions within universities. And so if you, if you kind of wanted to survive, if you wanted to kind of build a, a, a career within in early Franco Spain, you really had to demonstrate at least some degree of loyalty to the, uh, the Franco regime. So these people are um, experts, they're technical uh, experts. They're quite eminent within Spanish society, obviously, because they hold uh, either senior kind of government positions, university positions, research positions. They, you know, some of them are quite famous, quite well known. Uh, but they're also uh, all um, uh, supporters to a, a greater or lesser degree of this kind of nationalist, uh, semi-fascist uh, uh, regime. Um, and that's what I found particularly interested about them, because if we think about 
those kind of fields, so welfare, medicine, social security, in the middle of the 20th century. And we think about especially those, uh, those kind of fields on an international scale. So the work of organizations like the World Health Organization or UNICEF, or you know, think of any kind of international medical welfare uh, organization or Congress. We, you normally think of those as kind of progressive movements. Uh, as one's interested in, uh, you know, kind of associated with either kind of uh, liberals or with the left. And what you have in, in this case is uh, people of a very different ideological uh, standpoint uh, who are, who are uh, uh, engaging in these kind of international uh, medical and uh, welfare uh, organisations. And so uh, the reason that I thought they, they were interesting is this kind of, uh, is this tension between their uh, apparent political uh, beliefs within Spain and the, the kind of the language of international health and cooperation and humanitarianism they're using uh, when they're within these international organisations or events. And it's kind of fascinating to see these organisations kind of continue going through periods where people are focused on other things mm -hmm. you you have these events like in 1941 when um you know doctors are getting together across the axis and and even communicating with with the british and that happens more in the colonial period but maybe mm -hmm. we can talk a little bit about the sort of new world order and mm -hmm. and what the fascists were were trying to develop in this this scientific community Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, so as, as I said, we kind of generally think of these these kind of international welfare and, uh, and medical uh, organisations as being a kind of a left liberal phenomenon. But from the 1930s, really, um, there were uh, experts and technocrats from fascist Italy, from Nazi Germany, who were who were trying to kind of forge a new form of international uh, social cooperation uh, amongst fascist uh, powers. So obviously especially countries like fascist especially for countries like fascist Italy welfare and social security was important they had a particular vision of welfare and social security which was very different from uh, those uh, you know, experts on the on the left uh, one that kind of prioritized the you know the health of the nation or the health of the uh, the race and, and had you know operated on very different uh, assumptions from uh, uh, liberal democratic uh, countries but nonetheless health and welfare was very important and there was you know really from the end of the 1920s uh, kind of an explosion of cooperation between fascist movements and fascist uh, states in Europe and that included cooperation in the field of uh, fields of medicine health and uh, welfare and that really came to a head during the second world war particularly after the uh, nazi invasion of the soviet union in 1941 under the auspices of the, the so-called kind of nazi new order for europe so this idea that um, you know the, the nazi occupation of europe wasn't just an occupation it was also an opportunity to build a new form of european cooperation and what you saw so what i write about in in the first chapter uh, a particular series of uh, uh, typhus and tuberculosis conferences that are held in uh, berlin in, in 1941 which bring together uh, experts, health, public health experts from across uh, uh, either fascist states or collaborator states or kind of Nazi occupied states. So places like Spain, uh, Italy, France, Belgium, Hungary, uh, Slovakia. And th these meetings take place in Berlin actually at the same time as the anti Comintern uh, 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 pact is meeting. Uh, uh, in uh, Berlin and they they really do the same kind of stuff that you see experts doing in uh, health conferences in you know liberal and democratic periods so they say oh look there's a war on in wars people move uh, uh, across borders more than they did before obviously living conditions are bad and so what that means is that these diseases are going to, to spread like they did in the first world war and we therefore have to work together across borders to be able to manage uh, these diseases and uh, yeah, for many, this was a kind of a practical question. Um, it was something, it was a, a problem that had arisen that had to be dealt with, but it was also very much part of a political project. So a lot of these, uh, these experts saw health cooperation during the war as the basis for a kind of a new system of international cooperation that they thought would emerge after uh, uh, the you know, Nazi, you know, after the Axis uh, victory that they expected to come. Uh, and they envisaged a kind of a future world order based around this kind of uh, fascist international cooperation. And it's interesting and also kind of challenging for us because uh, as the reader and as an academic, as a scholar, you we have these labels and, and we're trying to assign them to certain places, but, but you sort of mentioned some of these internationalists kind of see what the Nazis are doing and that they're not going to actually use these, these cures in places like the say Warsaw ghetto or, or mm -hmm. where 
Jews are. Um, so how do you kind of get at that, the challenge between like these, these broad sort of defining terms as fascists and, and individuals who are working sometimes in line with this and sometimes refuse to work? Mm. Yeah, well, it's very difficult to to uh, to get a sense of what this cooperation meant for different, you know, for for the individuals involved. Obviously, there's a, uh, lots of individuals who all probably approached it in different ways. And so, looking at it from the Spanish perspective, so there were lots of Spanish experts involved in these projects. Some of the experts were clearly uh, 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 active fascist activists within Spain, and uh, so who embrace this kind of cooperation as part of their kind of their, you know, their fascist political views. So they, there were people, for example, who were uh, volunteering, who were part of the Spanish volunteer division that fought on the Eastern Front alongside Nazi forces, uh, who included, for example, uh, uh, kind of a leading fascist public health expert who were involved in these kind of uh, projects, and they saw it very much as part of their fascist activism. There were other Spanish experts who uh, had kind of central roles within the Franco regime, but who weren't fascists per se, who were kind of, uh, would have seen themselves as kind of uh, traditional nationalists or, or military figures uh, in Spain, who, who were kind of sympathetic maybe to some, uh, uh, to, you know, some of the characteristics of Spanish or uh, Italian fascism, uh, but also were critical uh, of some elements and then there were even other figures who who again were kind of uh, held roles within the franco regime but later on would move in towards the christian democratic kind of opposition to franco that emerged from the, the 1960s uh, who we can suspect maybe were uh, you know uh, uh, wanted to be involved in these projects from a kind of a technocratic a technical point of view but maybe didn't um wholeheartedly buy into the kind of the ideological the kind of political side um, one of the com complicating factors in trying to tease out these motivations is that it's difficult to work out what you what kind of evidence you can use so for example in the Spanish case a lot of the people I look at wrote about taking part in these conferences after the end of the Second World War after the defeat of Nazi Germany um, and their uh, the way they described their cooperation with the Nazis is obviously one has to suspect colored by what you know what you know they know later uh, uh, what later emerged about uh, uh, Nazi atrocities and uh, their desire to um, to distance themselves from the Nazis so for example you get some uh, uh, some stories from uh, one of the guys I look at Jose Palanca who's basically the kind of the minister of health uh, uh, under the early Franco regime who says yes I was in Berlin yes I, I, I went to these conferences but I never really thought they were you know I, I had to go they were a bit of a farce um, and who tells these stories about how you know, um, you know he 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 was kind of appalled by the anti-Semitism that he saw there, and he may well have been, but also he's 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 writing his kind of memoirs twenty years after the, the Second World War, and he may well what he may well have been doing is trying to kind of uh, after the fact distance himself from association with the Nazi regime. There are other figures who, for example, uh, in the nineteen sixties and the nineteen seventies, write about how they uh, you know. There was one particular guy called uh, Carlos uh, Jimenez Diaz, who was a, a leading uh, Francoist medical researcher, who wrote in his memoirs about how, when he was in uh, Berlin, he got um, uh, he was kind of um, he helps elderly Jews to cross the street and was uh, looked at kind of with mistrust by uh, by local Nazis. Um, and who knows, he might have done that, but it also sounds like a very convenient story to try right. to uh, uh, emphasize how uh, you know, his kind of uh, ideological disagreements with the Nazi regime. Hmm. And yeah, so there's a, I mean, there's a lot there to get sort of drawn into, but at the heart of your, your book here is, is this global story. And um, it does really put, put a sort of, uh, put into perspective Spain and, and sort of just how, how international powers in Europe were thinking at the time um, through the colonial projects they had. It seems that the sort of, internationalist atmosphere in Africa was very different than the wars that were occurring in Europe. Not that there weren't wars in Africa, but uh, the sort of colonial health seems to be more of cooperation across Axis mm -hmm. and ally boundaries. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So Spain um, uh, by this stage had uh, two kind of very small uh, colonial territories in Africa. So the northern part of uh, Morocco, so most of Morocco was controlled by the, the French, but the northern part of Morocco uh, had been controlled by the, the Spanish since the uh, early 20th century. Um, and then uh, what was known as Spanish Guinea, which is today Equatorial Guinea, uh, just on the, uh, on the west coast of Africa. Um, and 
what you can see happening both during and after the war is uh, a, a, a perhaps a quite surprising degree of uh, health and welfare cooperation between uh, the imperial powers uh, in Africa, including in, in some kind of a surprising degree, for example, between Francoist uh, colonial uh, powers in, uh, in uh, Spanish Guinea and free French uh, um, uh, governments, colonial governments in neighboring uh, territories. Um, and that cooperation, I mean, that builds on um, a longer history of inter-imperial cooperation in, in Africa, which I think was, was particularly evident in the interwar period. So, you know, the, the, the kind of the civilizing, the language of the civilizing mission in the, in the kind of interwar period and the increasing focus on uh, development in, in colonial Africa had kind of um, provoked an uh, increasing amount of cooperation between imperial powers in, in, uh, in uh, Africa in the, the interwar period. That continued during the Second uh, World War, but then also continued into the post-war period as well. So in the, the post-war period, uh, the remaining European uh, imperial powers were particularly keen to emphasize their development credentials in order to, to kind of um, uh, to uh, counter uh, you know, rising uh, nationalism uh, within uh, these African societies, rising demands for independence. But they were also particularly worried about the, the UN and the newly formed UN uh, would use uh, health and development as a way to, uh, as they saw it, interfere in uh, African affairs. And so from, from their point of view, if they could demonstrate that the imperial powers were already cooperating uh, to kind of promote African health and uh, uh, medicine and development then that would provide them with an excuse to prevent uh, organizations like the who and uh, unicef from uh, from engaging with africa and the un certainly offers an interesting thread to follow through all of this because of uh spain's well it's not an allegiance but spain's leanings during the war mm -hmm. uh the un kind of rejects spain how, how is franco what are some of the ways that franco's able to sort of shift this perspective because he he needs to be part of the world community after you know sort of this this autarky fails and he can't just be totally alone in spain mm -hmm. absolutely i mean the the end of the second world war is that probably that the point where franco and the franco regime is most vulnerable so obviously franco would come to power with the support of the axis powers during the early stage of the Second World War, he'd never, uh, he hadn't um, formally uh, become involved uh, with the uh, with the war, but he had sent this volunteer. Kind of the Second World War developed, he kind of gradually began to distance himself from uh, from the Axis powers and to kind of to build, rebuild links with the, the Allies, kind of hedging his bets. Um, but when the uh, uh, the Allies uh, victory came, and when the Axis uh, powers collapsed, that was really when uh, when the kind of the future of the Franco regime hung uh, hung in the balance. There were many uh, within the Allied coalition who wanted the Allies, who thought the uh, Allies, once they entered France, should invade Spain and uh, and remove the Franco regime. There were many Spanish exiles fighting with the French resistance and with uh, with Allied forces uh, in France. And uh, with the creation of the UN, there were there were many countries. Uh, uh, including the Soviet Union, but also including many countries in, in, in the West, who felt that um, uh, there could be no way that, that uh, Spain, you know, the Franco regime could continue in Spain in this post-fascist era, that it had to be removed somehow. And there was really a period from 1945 until 1947, early 1948, when uh, the future, where, where there were kind of very intense international uh, debates about what should happen, what should be done with the Franco regime. There was some talk about invasion. There were diplomatic and economic sanctions, and Spain was uh, was excluded from the newly founded uh, UN. And so during this this period, the Franco regime kind of worked uh, diplomatically to try and uh, to try and kind of reestablish its its legitimacy and try and kind of regain a, a foothold within the international system. And partly, they, uh, the regime did this by distance itself from its uh, fascist past. So the, the Franco regime had always been something of a coalition. It included uh, fascists. So there was a, a Spanish a fascist party called the Falange, which had played an important part in the Spanish Civil War. But the coalition also involved uh, uh, the Spanish military, um, uh, more traditional conservative uh, figures, and important Catholic uh, factions. So really, the kind of a, a, the full ideological spectrum of the, of the right. And so after the uh, uh, Second World War, Franco uh, removed many of his fascist ministers and promoted uh, many of the, uh, the Catholic politicians within the regime. So most notably in the case of uh, a Catholic, um, uh, long-standing Catholic politician and international activist called Martin Atajo, 
who was uh, uh, promoted to uh, Spanish foreign minister and who was really tasked with uh, presenting a new space of uh, uh, face for the Franco regime to the world. And then where that came, where this becomes important for my story is that um, one of the the forums in which this kind of process played out was in the uh, World Health Organization. So the World Health Organization was founded in 1946 as part of um, uh, the kind of the UN uh, system. And like with, in the UN, there was a big debate about whether Spain should be granted membership uh, or not. Um, and uh, ultimately, it wasn't when the uh, organization was founded in uh, 1946. Uh, but Spain saw the WHO and other kind of technical organizations like it as a kind of almost like a Trojan horse that it could use to enter the UN system, because there were lots of international health experts who thought that who really believed that membership of the uh, WHO should be universal, that there should be no kind of political barriers. For them, you know, health knows no kind of political uh, barriers. Everyone, every individual in the world has the right to good health. Therefore, every uh, state in the world, regardless of their political affiliation, should be allowed into the WHO. And the Franco regime was uh, really able to utilize uh, some of this kind of rhetoric uh, to gain uh, entry to the WHO. Um, uh, four years before it was able to uh, gain full membership of the UN and, uh, and organizations like the WHO and, and UNICEF kind of acted as a kind of a stepping stone to full uh, UN entry uh, membership that uh, ultimately came in 1955. The other big context of course for this kind of rehabilitation of the Franco regime is the, the Cold War so what uh, Franco did was to kind of position himself as the kind of the, the you know the uh, staunchest anti-communist uh, in the West. So he, he can't have argued that the, the Spanish Civil War hadn't been a fight between uh, fascism and democracy, has it generally been understood in the West, but as a, a fight between Western Christian civilization and uh, and the global threat of communism. So with this kind of, uh, with the rise of the Cold War, um, uh, Western states, particularly the US, were increasingly inclined to uh, to overlook uh, Franco's kind of uh, past sins. Uh, the combination of that and their ability to kind of leverage the language of international health and international humanitarianism in organisations like the WHO were what really helped uh, uh, this kind of process of gradual reacceptance within the UN system. And it is kind of extraordinary that they had, uh, so they had what you just described, this sort of health vehicle, and at the same time, uh, Catholicism as a central sort of uh, focus of, of the Franco regime and the history it has in Spain uh, mm -hmm. really helps the internationalism. The, the Catholic Church also had been, right, in, or at least uh, associated with fascist Italy, uh, how did the sort of Catholic identity of Spain help it to sort of rehabilitate its image in the West post-war? So I think, I mean, it was particularly important because of the, um, the, the kind of the religious revival, if you like, that took place in uh, Europe uh, and to, a, to an extent in uh, America after the Second World War. So we normally think of the kind of the Second World War era generally as a kind of a secular era. But the immediate post-war uh, years certainly saw a, re a revival of religious belief generally across and religious practice uh, uh, across Europe, but, but also the kind of political rise of movements like the, uh, the Christian Democrats uh, movement. So, you know, most Western European states after the war were led by Christian Democrats and particularly by Catholic Christian Democrats, so people like Adenauer in Germany, like de Gasperi uh, in Italy. And... Uh, many of these uh, people had been active in international Catholic networks in the interwar period. And these were exactly the same networks that Spanish Catholics who were now part of the Franco regime had been involved in. So although the Franco regime was not Christian democratic, so although there was a, a kind of an ideological uh, divide between um, uh, uh, Spanish Catholicism and uh, Western European Christian democratic Catholicism, they also shared a, a certain language, a certain conception of, of of kind of politics and particularly of you know what what the the West what it meant to be part of the West um, that kind of um, promoted uh, 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 kind of sympathy towards Spain in general and the the Franco regime in, in particular. I think in the the field of health, what it uh, and and kind of welfare and social expertise, what it allowed. Um, Spanish experts to do is to kind of tap into this uh, uh, the language of social Catholicism so obviously since the end of the 19th century the uh, Catholics and the Catholic Church have been increasingly interested in social uh, provision partly as a way of, of kind of um, uh, preventing uh, you know uh, uh, 
the Catholic working classes from from kind of defecting to, to communism or to, to socialism. And so uh, you know, in the in the interwar period, social Catholicism had been an important part of kind of the, the, the um, international uh, Catholic uh, milieu, um, and um, many. Uh, Spanish <clears throat> health and welfare experts came from within this tradition and they therefore shared when they were going to kind of international conferences and international organizations they shared uh, a set of languages and assumptions with their Catholic counterparts from other Western European and, and North American states which again really helped with their integration of these uh, these kind of networks. Hmm. And, and another theme that we sort of th see, though, is not only just these kind of successful networks, but you also have uh, a pushback, and you, you've alluded to it a couple times in the conversation so far. Certainly, it, it pops up in, in my research where I'm looking at refugees, where, I mean, there's, there's two massive refugee crises, at least in World War II, and you, you know, you have the Jewish exile from Europe and at the same time you have the Spanish uh, everyone who fought against Franco leaving mm -hmm. Spain and that continues for a long time and they go right to the to other countries they don't stay in Spain so what what is the sort of opposite perspective to these Franco's internationalists mm -hmm. are, are they getting pushed back abroad are they getting pushed back from the refuge former refugees or yeah, absolutely. So partly they get they get some pushback. So from within international organisations, so within organisations like the WHO. So as an example, um, as I said, many of the kind of the leading uh, Spanish experts had supported the Republic, had gone into exile after the Spanish Civil War, um, and and many of them had played important kind of international roles in the interwar period with organisations like the League League of Nations. Um, so uh, one. Uh, uh, a good example is a guy called Marcelino Pasqua, who was the, uh, the kind of the Minister of Health for the Republican uh, um, government prior to the Spanish Civil War, he was a leading international health expert, worked with organizations like the League of Nations Health Organization. Um, and then during the Second World War, uh, took on kind of political roles, with, uh, sorry, the Spanish Civil War took on political roles with the Republic. So he was the, the Republican ambassador to Moscow, the Republican ambassador to, uh, to uh, France during the Spanish Civil War. And then after the uh, Spanish Civil War, he went into exile. And after the Second World War, he managed to, uh, to kind of uh, gain a position within the newly created uh, World Health Organization. Um, and so he was uh, uh, within the World Health Organization when the Franco regime and Franco experts were trying to use that organization as a kind of a foothold back into the international community. And he had a real kind of personal rivalry with this guy I've already mentioned, Jose Palanca, who was the, the Francoist uh, Minister of Health. And who who had kind of known each other? They'd known each other for kind of uh, decades, and had been kind of political and professional rivals at home. Um, and that rivalry then played out within the, the WHO, where uh, it seems that um, uh, uh, um, Marcelino Pascual was lobbying to prevent Spain from being granted membership in the early 1950s, uh, 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 but ultimately failed uh, failed to do so. And uh, Jose Palanca, this Francoist expert, when he writes about Spain's kind of being granted membership of the WHO in 1951, he he talks about how uh, his rival uh, Pascual is in the in the audience and how he's the only person who doesn't clap when Spain is kind of formally announced as a member. But it also it probably plays itself out most obviously in Latin America. So we've already mentioned um, uh, Africa is an important um, uh, focus of Francoist international activity. But the other kind of key area was Latin America and. Um, you know, Latin America played a very important part in the Francoist and the Spanish nationalist uh, imagination because of Spain's kind of historical uh, imperial ties uh, to the region. Um, and uh, uh, Spanish Francoist kind of elites attempted to, and the government tried to promote this idea of Ibero-America as a, as a kind of a distinct international uh, region, um, uh, united by ties of history, of colonialism, obviously, of religion uh, and of language. And that really played itself out in the kind of uh, health and social fields as well. So um, uh, Spanish experts um, uh, sought to kind of build ties with Latin America, uh, uh, even kind of at the end of the Second World War and the immediate post-war period where they, they were kind of excluded from all other kind of international um, uh, forums. And then they tried to create a new Ibero-American uh, uh, health and uh, social organizations to try and kind of cement their influence there. But Latin America was also, as you, uh, as you alluded to, where a lot of these Republican exiles had ended up after the uh, Spanish Civil War. So it was really there that Francoist experts came face to face with their kind of Republican uh, counterparts and from uh, protests from 
sometimes from various Republicans, sometimes from uh, Latin American uh, uh, leftists uh, who, who you know, stood up you know, when they were speaking at universities, who stood up and denounced Francoist experts as fascists and told them to leave their country and all of these kind of things. And, and so there, was a, uh, there, were, there were some cases where uh, exiled Republicans tried to uh, uh, put forward a kind of a, an alternative vision of Ibero-American uh, uh, solidarity based on kind of you know, uh, uh, left-wing visions of, a, of kind of a, a solidarity and uh, political sympathy uh, in contrast to what they saw as the kind of the neo, what they characterized the neo-imperialist tendencies within Francoist uh, Ibero-American uh, thoughts and projects. And, and ultimately, I mean, through, throughout the book, you're giving us evidence of these people who have, who have sort of gone, gone abroad and, and whether there's, you know, pushback or, or not, they're, they are to a certain extent completing this mission. Um, you use this great uh, evidentiary base that I think a, a lot of people kind of forget the significance of the, the World's Fair as an example. And, and these are kind of like great, uh, you know, uh, materials and and things that actually mattered quite a bit, um, and it and it's getting towards the sort of the the end of the period of your s story. Do, are the world's fairs significant in this? Does it show a sort of completion at all of this mission, or no? Yeah, it's a tricky one. So the the the, the one I talk about is the 1958 Universal Exhibition, which was in. Uh, Brussels. It was the first one of the post-war uh, period, the first kind of Cold War universal exhibition. So it's most famous for, I think it was just after the uh, the launch of Sputnik, so the Soviet Union uh, um, displayed a kind of a model of Sputnik in its uh, in its hall. Um, and Spain was represented there. So by the 1950s, Spain had really become what it remained until the uh, until the Franco's death, which was a kind of semi-integrated member of the the Western international community. So you know, it was part of the UN, it was part of the WHO, uh, it was um, uh, uh, you know its experts and, uh, and elites were accepted within international conferences and events and networks, but it wasn't part of NATO, it wasn't part of the European uh, community, and that's really kind of how it how it stayed for for the rest of the, the Franco regime. Um, so. Spain is represented at the Universal uh, Exposition, where it was interesting from my point of view, and actually where where you got most kind of Spanish engagement with it was around the um, uh, the Vatican uh, Pavilion. So the, uh, obviously uh, Belgium is a, 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 a Catholic country, and the um, uh, Belgium organisers saw the Universal Exposition as a way of promoting a very distinct kind of uh, distinctly Catholic vision of uh, of global community and humanity and the Vatican uh, uh, exposition was one of the the, the, the main centers and the most popular kind of attractions uh, at, uh, uh, at the event and it was uh, the site for uh, uh, kind of a really wide uh, array of international Catholic events and conferences uh, uh, and uh, projects so including for example uh, international Catholic medical uh, conferences which are or, or international Catholic nursing conferences which a lot of uh, Spaniards uh, are involved in and I think from a, a Spanish point of view it really uh, uh, illustrates the the, um, the extent to which their post-war integration was based around this kind of idea of a shared Catholic and Christian identity with other Western European and uh, and North and uh, South American uh, countries. For, you know, for them, that was really the most uh, fruitful, uh, fruitful kind of avenue of, of cooperation by the 1950s. Hmm. And now here we are, you know, in 2019, and, and this week is, uh, you know, October of 2019 for, you know, people are going to be listening to this, I think, for a long time to come. It's a fascinating topic. Uh, but it, there, in the news is, is Franco's remains are being exhumed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is still such an important conversation that people are having in Spain, people are having globally about Franco and the Franco regime. Um, what have you received feedback so far? What what are people kind of saying about this conversation on uh, Franco, and and how has your work been received? Well, I mean, you know, to be honest, it's, it's too early to, to, <laughs> to say how it's been. I mean, I've, uh, I know how it's been received by the kind of the, the historians that I've uh, spoken to about it, who uh, who kind of I think find it uh, interesting. I, I'm, I don't think it has a kind of a, a broad public uh, profile in Spain. It'd be very interesting to to see if it gets translated. Uh, if it does, I think. I mean, obviously, the memory of uh, the Franco regime is very fought in Spain. The memory of the Franco regime and the, and the Spanish Civil War. So the, you know, the historical memory has been a kind of a big uh, 
the key, the key topic in um, uh, Spanish historiography over the last uh, few decades. And it's been a really uh, important part of the political debate in, in Spain as well, as we can see from this kind of debate at the moment about the exhumation of uh, Franco's, uh, Franco's remains. I don't think I'm... Uh, necessarily trying to make a kind of an intervention in in that debate so it's although i'm kind of focusing on uh, uh you know spanish uh, social experts and, and focusing on the, the kind of the propagandistic use that the franco regime made uh, uh, uh of their idea of kind of uh, the social state and the welfare state in spain uh, ultimately as um uh, many, many historians have uh, demonstrated over the last uh, few decades the Franco regime was not a social state, it was not a welfare state in the way that we, uh, that we kind of understand it in, uh, 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 now. It was a highly repressive uh, uh, dictatorship which uh, you know, killed uh, and uh, uh, imprisoned and tortured uh, thousands of its uh, citizens, particularly in this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of early stage. Um, <laughs> So I, I, you know, I think it, the kind of the relevance of this story is probably less towards the you know to to debates in Spain at the moment and more to some of the uh, the stuff that's happening in our international system at the moment. So when I started working on this, what it would have been in two thousand and thirteen, hmm. I think it, so. It's pre Brexit, mm -hmm. pre Trump. It's you know. In the era where kind of say organizations, you know, people like Orban and uh, Le Pen are, 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 are kind of influential. But what we've seen since I started this project actually is, is the real rise, the reemergence of forms of what you might call the kind of the transnational, the international far right. So efforts, uh, uh, particularly within Europe, to uh, to bring together various forms of kind of populist right wing uh, movements. Some under the leadership of people like Steve uh, Steve Bannon, who's been kind of active in trying to foster cooperation between European uh, far right uh, movements, as well as this kind of you know, uh, you know the explosion of kind of global far right networks joined together. It seems quite often by uh, by the internet and, and social media that we see with some of the kind of the rise of. Uh, transnational far-right white nationalist uh, terrorism and I think what's that that that's really done is brought back into the focus uh, and kind of brought to everyone's attention that what I think is a fairly basic and kind of obvious point that it's possible you know cooperation across borders isn't uh, fundamentally doesn't isn't necessarily always a progressive or a liberal or a, a, a positive thing there's nothing to stop uh, uh, fascist nationalist people we don't uh, agree with or we don't like cooperating across borders uh, uh, just as much as people on uh, uh, the left or, or, or people or, or uh, liberals and I think that's that's where this history is is particularly important right it just reminds us uh, that that uh, far right ultra nationalist fascist movements have always thought internationally hmm. um, and, and, that and we have to think about them although it seems some in some way counterintuitive to think of ultra nationalist movements as also internationalists they ultimately are right so the rise hmm. of fascism in the interwar period was uh, did not take place in a, a, a one single nation. It was undoubtedly a transnational phenomenon. Ideas were shared across borders uh, and applied uh, to, to different cultures. Individuals traveled across borders, they cooperated with each other. And that's exactly the same now, right? The rise of uh, the new gen kind of generation of uh, far right populists uh, looks different in every different country, manifests itself differently in every different country, but is all ultimately all part of an interlinked phenomenon. So you see this in Spain as well. For the Spain in the first, for the first time since the transition to democracy, we now have uh, a far right uh, a party, uh, 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 party which is gaining seats in, in national parliaments, which is forming part of uh, local uh, uh, governments, and that has its, uh, this party called Vox has its own kind of unique. Spanish characteristics, not least its kind of uh, reverence for the Franco regime and uh, Francoist uh, history, but it's very clearly part of this uh, general rise of the, the, the populist right in uh, Europe and North America. And this is, yeah, this is absolutely fascinating stuff. And um, I see, I sort of feel like with this and, and with your use of the intellectuals anyway, you have sort of like an endless uh, uh, sample size because there's, there's so many people that are heads of organizations that have to interact with, with these regimes and somehow have to navigate international organizations as well. Mm. It, it's really complex stuff. And, and I think it's really uh, useful to us. I feel that you're you're sort of with your work getting pulled more into the future a lot of historians i talk to end up end up writing 
their next book about an earlier era. <laughs> uh, are, are you getting pulled to, in one direction or the other? Are you going to stick with these sort of intellectual histories? Um, what's interesting you now? Yeah, well, so I think I think I'm um, probably moving towards the future, um, uh, and I think I mean one of the things that uh, 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 I'm interested in. So I'm, I'm interested in this kind of post-war period. So one of the things I'm working on at the moment is is um, uh, refugee movements in the uh, the post-war era, and, and uh, particularly kind of Christian uh, NGOs and their support for um, refugees fleeing communism in the the early Cold War, and the, the way that. Um, uh, these NGOs, which including Spanish uh, NGOs, used uh, kind of uh, refugees and refugee relief as a way of um, uh, kind of promoting a particular vision of the Cold War and the, the Cold War West. So the way that they kind of made used refugees as a, as a kind of a way to make anti-communism and to make the kind of the dangers of communism real for uh, citizens of the West in the early Cold War. Um, and I think that's uh, you know that's kind of part of. I see that as part of the project, which a number of historians have kind of been um, uh, kind of focusing on recently, of uh, un- recovering the kind of the the very uh, conservative Christian foundations of many of the the kind of the post-war uh, international, at least Western institutions. So it's, it, the post-war world is commonly referred to as the kind of the beginning of the liberal world order. But actually, if you look back at the 1940s and the 1950s, there's not much that's liberal uh, about it in the way that we would understand it now about a lot of the organizations that and, and movements that are emerging. And I think beyond that, I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm very interested in is the, the kind of the wider history of transnational anti-communism across the, the 20th century. So I think the, the Franco regime, yeah, if there's one thing that links all of these kind of forms of Francoist internationalism together, one thing that uh, links kind of you know, fascist international cooperation with Catholic international cooperation, one thing that kind of uh, links Spain's kind of you know, Nazi partners with its uh, kind of you know, slightly more progressive WHO uh, partners in the 1950s is that is anti-communism, is an opposition to the Soviet Union and to the, the, the perception of the global communist uh, threat. And I think it's um, you know, it's part of a much uh, wider and very uh, uh, interesting uh, 20th century uh, history of transnational anti-communism, which you can argue, but I think perhaps is the, the kind of defining intellectual and political force of the 20th century, right? It's, it's you know, if, if you think about, um, you know, whatever kind of area you're interested in, if you think about, um, you know, the rise of fascism, um, the emergence of social democracy, the creation of the welfare states, the Cold War, the European... Uh, the European Union. The, the one thing they all have in common is is uh, is uh, anti-communism, um, mm. and so I think that's uh, I, my kind of future project is to to think about you know to broaden my perspective from Spain and try and think about that that kind of wider history and think about how anti-communism has uh, acted as a kind of hub for particularly kind of conservative or nationalist uh, nationalist to cooperate across uh, borders. And obviously, if we take this up to the present day. Obviously, communism is is not uh, a live kind of threat uh, to the uh, to the right today. So you wouldn't describe Bannon or Trump or Le Pen as anti-communists, but I think a lot of their kind of language, uh, a lot of their iconography, a lot of their uh, uh, a lot of their rhetoric, immer- to some extent has its origins in this kind of 20th century transnational uh, anti-communist traditions and you know if you think about you know Bolsonaro when he became uh, uh, his presidential inauguration in uh, in in Brazil he kind of he had a red flag on on stage which I think he tried to burn this kind of you think about the kind of the the uh, the uh, rhetorical opposition to uh, to socialism and progressive movements amongst these kind of radical right wing movements. I think I, I think we need to take you know twentieth century anti communism seriously as as a, the kind of the origin story of the the populist transnational right we see today. Yeah, that's going to be fascinating, and and we'll have to keep an eye on that. Now, one thing you did with this book is that it's uh, it, through the publishing is it's open access. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so this is great. So rather than costing uh, however many, $70, $80 uh, to buy, you can just download Franco's Internationalist for free from the uh, Oxford University uh, Press uh, website, which is great. Um, it's uh, That was uh, made possible thanks to the Wellcome Trust. So I said the Wellcome Trust is this uh, research organization that funded the project that my PhD was, uh, was part of. Um, 
uh, and basically, I mean, it's only made possible because the Work and Trust paid quite a lot of money <laughs> to mm-hmm. make it open access. Um, and but obviously, open access is is kind of a big uh, movement now for anyone who works in, in kind of universities or academia. Or in, you know, so there are conversations that we're having uh, we're having a lot. Obviously, there's the emergence of things something called Plan S, which is going to kind of push. Uh, looks like all journals uh, publishing uh, models. I know I've been lucky enough to have the kind of funding available to for most of my kind of previous articles to be open access. Um, and you know, there's debates about how that is practically going to work in the future and the, you know, the impact that's going to have on the kind of academic publishing industry. But ultimately, I think from my point of view, it's, it's, it's got to be a, a good thing, right? And when you write these kind of academic monographs, especially like mine, and kind of a first book with publishers like, you know, the University Presses, hardback books are too expensive for ordinary people to afford, right? No one's, you know, only a handful of people are going to buy a seventy pound uh, uh, kind of uh, book mm. like this. Um, you know, it's really for you know the, the mod publishing model is there's the, a, few, a few copies get bought by university libraries, but if it's open access, it's you know available to anyone. So you, know, you can just go and download it, and hopefully, what that means is that it gets a much uh, wider audience uh, than it uh, otherwise, which is really really fantastic. Yeah, and I think that's great, and and we'll certainly have links to that at hourofhistory.com, so you can go and and find that open access. Because, uh, I mean, the details in the book, like like you said, it, it was grown out of a dissertation. So I mean, every sentence is packed with a citation, and and so there's tons of stuff there, uh, tons of material that you can sort of unpack. And and the fact that it's open access, yeah, just hopefully it, it not only opens the doors for an audience, but it also um, is just easy right mm-hmm. it, it's just a click and it's there <laughs> it, it's so i don't know it, it i'm i'm glad you're you're uh experimenting with this and it's nice of the the welcome uh, trust to do this yeah absolutely. um yeah so that's that's fantastic uh now we're drawing towards the end of the hour here and we're getting towards the best time i think when we do the suggestions uh, uh what do you have for <laughs> us david so I said before, this is my this is the thing I've been worrying about, right? I've been trying to think about amazing recipes I could share with things like that. So um, my, the, the thing I decided that I was going to say uh, was that I think for a lot of your listeners will uh, uh, maybe, as we said at the start, not know a lot about um, uh, Spanish history, but hopefully on the back of our conversation will be interested to find out a little bit more. So I thought what I'd do is recommend uh, a book. Uh, which I think is, is particularly great. Uh, and that book is um, uh, a book called uh, by a historian called Ronald Fraser called The Blood of Spain. And it's a, a book about the Spanish uh, Civil War published in 1979. Uh, it's an oral history. So Ronald Fraser is one of the pioneers of oral history. And he, he put together this uh, this book through interviews uh, with uh, um, uh, Spaniards between you know in the late 1970s so kind of shortly after Franco's death and he interviewed uh, kind of leading figures from the Spanish Civil War but also kind of a big range of uh, ordinary Spaniards as well and he's put together this uh, this book uh, as a kind of collection of these oral history interviews and it's kind of an amazing impressionistic history of the Spanish Civil War told from these kind of multiple uh, perspectives um, and it's really it's, it's so engaging to read and it's just such a great job at uh, kind of uh, revealing the kind of the complexities of the kind of the lived experience of, of the Spanish Civil War, and it really uh, it really reminds me of uh, you know some of your listeners might be familiar with the work of Svetlana uh, Alexievich, who's the the Belarusian uh, author who won the the Nobel Prize for Literature a few uh, years ago, who wrote these kind of uh, famous oral history uh, accounts of Chernobyl and the uh, the end of the Soviet Union, uh, and it really it shares these kind of characteristics, right? It really brings, uh, for me, it's the, the book that best brings the experiences of the, the Spanish Civil War and the Spanish society in that time uh, to life. So, if you're interested in Spain, uh, Ronald Fraser's Blood of Spain is the book that I'd recommend. Thank you. And that's that's a fantastic suggestion where people can uh, get more. And it's certainly easy to get lost in the Spanish Civil War, just an endlessly sort of fascinating conflict. My suggestion uh, changed up in the middle of this. I I haven't thought about this book in a while, but it it sort of came up as we're talking about these things that, you know, kind of survive through regime change or through big uh, cultural events. The book uh, written by Jeffrey Baker called El Sistema, orchestrating Venezuela's youth. It came out in 2014. So Venezuela was a pretty different place. Mm -hmm. Not entirely different. You know, some of the systems were still in place, but it's not in the hyperinflation economy that it is now. But Baker uh, sort of traces this, you know, this orchestra that has worldwide renown through 
a regime change and through and it you know it's always for the youth and for the people and somehow it survives right governments left governments uh, center governments governmental change revolution so uh, it's kind of a fascinating look and and again taking some of these organizations that's that survive through these massive changes so i, I think it's a fascinating book for people to check out um, that's great. So you got a lot of information here. Uh, go to ourhistory.com so you can get links to all these great materials. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we sign off, David? No, just thank you very much for, for having me on. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure on Hour of History. It's our world anytime, any place. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out our recommendations page at ourhistory.com forward slash rex. That's ourhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. There you'll find links to the books mentioned during the podcast, and if you choose to purchase one, you'll be supporting the podcast in the process. And if you still haven't gotten your fill of the Hour of History, make sure you head over to the Hour of History blog found at hourofhistory.com forward slash blog, with articles being released fairly often on topics relating to those covered in the podcast as well as others. With that, we conclude this episode and hope to have you back for the next one. Take care, and again, thanks for listening to the Hour of History podcast.